some um, really useful stuff. I'll pop the spotlight on you, Sarah. Perfect. Uh, you. Hello. Hello. Thanks, Barry. Hi, everybody. Uh, loads of people here today, which is just such a pleasure. I am I've, I'm in the olden days hark back, was really used to delivering to people in person. And I got to say, I do miss it. So I just want to give a special shout out to those people with their cameras on because you make me feel like I'm not shouting into an abyss. And it's just lovely. So thank you very much. Um, I'm Sarah Vestal and I'm going to I'm going to kind of it's going to be not such an intense learning experience, but maybe more of a journey. And I want to kind of talk about mental health in the workplace and creating psychologically safe spaces. But I just want to sort of caveat that and say this is not going to be um, a, a massive education on mental health. It's probably it's going to be quite frank and honest. I am going to start the session by just giving you a little bit of an insight into myself. So I'm going to tell you about me. Uh, I, I've done this across the country for many years where I share my own life experience and my life story. Um, and one of the weird kickbacks of that is that lots of people know some quite intense things about me and and it's it's kind of weird having people that I that know such the inner workings of who I am and and what what my background is but um, I'm really happy to share this with you today and a part of why I share my story is to kind of illustrate what it's like to live with a mental health problem and also what it's like to to work with a mental health problem and what it's like to be a business leader with a mental health problem and cr climb that career ladder regardless of my mental health problem. Um, I use the words mental health problem instead of mental illness. I got in the habit of doing that at mind. So, um, but I, words, words can be a really weird one. I tend to veer away from using words to describe myself that are derogatory, like, um, like a crazy or those kind of things, because it's, it's not really like that. Um, but I also don't mind if other people do, just to put that out there. So I'm going to talk about myself and my mental health problems. What a what a time to be alive. And and I just kind of want to say at the beginning that sometimes I'm I'm really used to doing this. So I'm very honest and very open, and I'm more than happy to have questions and I'm happy to talk about it openly. But that's not really the case for everyone. That's definitely the case for me because I've been doing this for years. Um, but what I might say might actually trigger something and again I, I'm careful with that word trigger it's a it's a bit of a weird word to fall back on but we're familiar with it so if um, some of my story brings something up in you or makes you feel like um, oh my god that is how I feel please do get in touch with Barry or Emma at the end of the session or have a look to see if there's um, support services like your EAP service to to help you if anything upsets you so I, but in general it's probably going to be okay because I'm reasonably funny so you're going to be all right so um, I'll give you a little bit of my background on how I came to be here I have been in the UK for about 17 and a half years and I am originally from New Zealand or as people like to guess is it South Africa is it Australia I well it's from New Zealand I'm from New Zealand and I actually had the most incredible childhood. So my my background, I was born to Paul and Anna Restall, who are two wonderful human beings. My father is a photographer, my mother's a teacher, and they're both musicians. So I have an older sister as well, Annalise. Um, she's named after a yacht that was sailed around the world by a woman. So, you know, this is the kind of family I come from. It's a bit lovey-dovey. Excellent communicators, musicians, artists really encouraged conversations with us as kids. We were taken along to these festivals where my parents would perform and we had a really beautiful uh, childhood in New Zealand. Um, when I was 12 years old, I were, we, we decided to move on to our boat. So we moved on to a yacht and that was a catch, not like a yacht, like a big super launch thing, like just a, a 36 foot wooden catch sailing boat. We moved onto the sailing boat and uh, sailed around the Marlborough Sounds. And Marlborough is a classic, um, you can kind of, I guess, unless you've been to New Zealand, you might think wine country. 
and it is indeed. So I grew up in the most beautiful countryside, clear blue waters. We would see seals and dolphins. There were orca. It was just an incredible time. And at the age of 12, uh, when we did this, I, I got taken out of school and put into correspondence school or homeschooling. And it's important that I kind of bring this up because I think that it was around about the age of 12 or 13 or when the hormones kicked in that I actually started to have a mental health problem. And no, I didn't notice. Nobody noticed because my environment was so fantastic that nobody noticed that there was something brewing inside my beautiful, complex brain. Uh, so we had a lot of lovely time on the boat. That was really nice. Um, I did very well academically. I was really good at self-learning. So all of that stuff was nice as well. My sister was nice. We had a nice cat. Everything was just so nice. And and I kind of, I usually get to this point in the story where I say, don't worry, I'm not boasting. This is not just to make you all feel incredibly jealous of my idyllic childhood. The reason I tell this part of the story is because I really want to hammer home that I had the perfect childhood, but that I have a mental health problem regardless of this. And there's something really important in that story because we we can assume that you develop a mental health problem if something bad happens to you or if you are having problems or trauma. And it's just not true. Uh, we are just as likely, but it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't say, oh, I'm only coming for you, person who's had a horrible childhood, or I'm only going to come for you, person who's suffered a trauma. We all have the capacity to have a mental health problem. And it doesn't matter if you've had a wonderful childhood or nothing bad has happened to you or you never got bullied or you have lovely parents. And my parents are still lovely. They're still in love with each other. So I still haven't experienced that that sort of trauma of parents not being together or the things that often we can lay blame to in, in our lives. So I had this mental health problem and I didn't know about it. And I think that this is another sort of issue with having such a nice childhood is that when the mental health problem started to exhibit itself, I uh, I never sought help because I, in a way, I didn't feel like I deserved to go and get help for having a mental health problem. I mean, I had a nice life. Someone else, someone else deserves to go and get that help, not me. Uh, so I never got help for it. And what I'm going to do is is just kind of really briefly explain what happens to me and what my mental health problem is. So I have an anxiety disorder. And the best way of describing what happens to me is to say, imagine that, so here I am in my office, my office, and it's my studio because I'm an artist. And imagine that this office actually holds all of the emotions and thoughts in, in my world. So what am I going to have for lunch? And wasn't I amazing for going to the gym this morning? And or what am I doing tomorrow? And what's going on with my agenda for next week? And it's all swirling around in this lovely space. Well, what happens to me when I have a mental health problem is that I will take one idea and that idea might be the most inoffensive idea. So the last anxiety attack I had was I was going to um, a friend's birthday party and I, I had to walk for 20 minutes and I didn't know whether or not to wear my good looking shoes or my practical shoes. And that idea, my friends, was my demise. So what happens is all of this energy that happens in this room suddenly starts to focus on that one idea. And imagine you've got an empty toilet roll holder. So one of those cardboard things that everybody just leaves sort of seductively on the toilet system. So one of those cardboard empty toilet roll holders and imagine all of the thoughts and ideas and all of the energy that is usually contained in this big space flushing through that tiny space like a waterfall. And it really impacts me physically as well. So I'll start to get um, hyperventilate and I'll start to shake and go into kind of seizures. Uh, I will cry uncontrollably. Um, I, I will not be able to be in control of myself because the entirety of my body has been taken over by an animal portion of me. So I work with neuroscientists now, so I'm about to like come into some neuroscience for you. Basically, your fr frontal lobe, that, that part of your brain at the front is capable of controlling your body and it's capable of language and it's capable of understanding things and it's capable of, of rational thinking because it has all of your language capabilities up the front there. 
Then there's the, the little thing that looks like a prawn, the amygdala in the top part of your brain. And that thing is responsible for taking care of you. So people say it's the fight or flight. So that little thing will kick in to action when it feels that you are in danger. Now, the problem with that little thing is that it doesn't have a very uh, great brain and it does have a lot of power. So it flushes all of these like enzymes and horrendous feelings through my body and I'm like seizing up and it will often take about six hours for me to get over that or to, to come down and calm down, which is not a great thing. So I started having these anxiety attacks when I was um, in my early 20s and it would be over really small things, but I didn't really know how to articulate that this was happening and I didn't know who to talk to and it did. It got worse and worse and worse and it got to the point where um, where and, and the other thing is, is that I appear very um, fine. <laughs> So I appear confident and able to get on with things and very good and very robust, but inside it, it, it's not actually working properly. Things are misfiring. So it got to the point in the, uh, where in my life uh, where I was working for a modeling agency, not as a top model. I know it's a surprise to everybody, but in fact, as the head of sales and marketing for a modeling and acting agency. And it was quite a high power job, but my boss was really... Um, frightening. I found her to be an unsettling person because I didn't know what to expect. So there weren't any clear boundaries. We didn't understand each other. We didn't communicate well. And I would panic not knowing if I was going into the office on one day, not knowing if she was going to say, hi, darling, I love your shoes or try and get me in a tutu. Or if I'd come in and she would just give me a cold, dark stare and I would have to go through this like file effects of all the things that I could have potentially done wrong to warrant such coldness from her. And it got to the point where every day I would drive to work. And this is, by the way, the thing that I was saying about the trigger spot, because turns out I'm not the only one that's done this. I would drive to work and I would look for a place to have a car accident because I would rather be dead or in hospital than go to work. And I felt like that was my only option like that's how that's how far my amygdala had taken me and how far yes exactly emily it was thank god you know it was the devil wears prada this is exactly what i used to say to people um but yes yeah, sorry i just saw that emily popped up that it sounds like the devil wears prada um but i would drive to work and i think where can i have a car accident where can i have an accident where it won't hurt anyone else where can i have an accident where it's not going to um cause anyone else to be late for work what can i do to try and um, to try and let something else take control of what's going on because I was so lost, which is a really bad thing. And so I recognised that this was happening, and I was able to quit my job and I went back to university and restudied. Um, so fast forward many many years, I still didn't seek help. By the way, everybody, this guy still didn't talk to anyone. <laughs> Just changed her life, quit her job, moved countries. Why not? Uh, so so that's what I did. I came over here and um, when I arrived in the UK, I was a high school teacher and I loved teaching. But this is where I got really into mental health. Um, so I only taught here for a year and a half and I ended up leaving to go and work in mental health services with young people because I understood that actually there was a systemic issue. There's a systemic issue in our society, in our culture, where we don't uh, encourage people to speak out or speak openly and we need to try and resolve that. Fast forward on my uh, resume, I guess I've spent the last best part of the decade, so eight or nine years working in mental health and workplaces and developing uh, programs to support organisations with their mental health policy and their mental health strategy. And I probably I, I probably cut my teeth at Mind, where I was a program manager for a campaign called Time to Change. And Time to Change, you might be familiar with, it's been around for about 10 or 11 years. Uh, it's a campaign to address the stigma attached to mental health problems. And the stigma attached to mental health problems is actually the number one thing that any organisation needs to address 
first and foremost. So in the last 10 years, I've worked with lots and lots of different organisations and managers to support them with helping with mental health in the workplace. But basically, you can throw as much money as you like at training people to be mental health first aiders. You can throw money at uh, getting EAP services up in action. But unless you have already cultivated an environment where people feel like they know how to speak out, where managers know how to support people, where colleagues know how to talk to each other, then you're not actually going to get people using those services until they hit crisis point. So that is what every part of me is trying to avoid. I don't want anyone else to ever be trying to go to work and looking for a place to have an accident or a place where they need to, I, I don't want anyone to ever feel like that is their only option because it's a really horrific place to be and it's also very preventable. So what I'm going to do today is take you through what is an easy tool. So I've adapted it just to like give you a bit of history on this tool. Um, the tool is kind of, it's something that, that was developed at Mind. I was joking with Emma and Barry. At Mind, they call it a WAP, which is, means a, a wellness action plan, I think. But unfortunately, that it's been a, a really popular song has kind of fouled the WAP acronym. Can't remember who sings it, but there we go. <laughs> uh, but the one that I've got, I know, look, I'm looking at you going, what kind of song is this? You can Google WAP if you like. Like, I mean, I'm not going to stop you. But I haven't called my tool a WAP, and I've adapted it from it because I found it to be a long document. So it was initially developed by Mind. Um, <laughs> Exactly. It was a, initially, it was. I'm. I'm loving this chat function, by the way, because it makes me feel like you're really engaged. Um, so it was a, a. Originally, it was kind of put together as a document, a really big fat document that supports people who are coming back to work after a period of mental ill health. So that that's still a fantastic idea. So as a manager or in your organisation, you should check in on your policies or especially the return to work policies and um, think about, is everyone Googling it now? <laughs> Here we go. So <laughs> don't do it. So, um, but it's a really good idea to have something in place to support someone on their return to work. So what I've done though, is I've kind of taken the essence of this document. It's got a lot of value when it comes to supporting your teams and your colleagues and your own self. And what I'm going to do is share my screen and I'll just take you through a PowerPoint and I hopefully won't bore you to death too much with it. And hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. Bear with me as I go through my fabulous thing. Okay, and then... I don't even know how to go from my current slide. Here we go from the beginning. Wonderful. OK, so I've renamed it Empowering Yourself and Others to Support Mental Fitness because I think that we need to kind of stay away a little bit from the mental health side of things. This is a low key document. This is not an educational piece. This is designed to support that stigma bit and help people with having those conversations in the first instance. So uh, we're, what I wanted to do with this as well, because I understand that most of you in your role are agile managers, so you, you actually support teams yourself. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an insight into my own lived experience. I want to talk about mental fitness and what you consider when you're thinking about how you are feeling. And I want to look at how we can use this one page tool that I've got and I'll send it to you to help your team with self-awareness. And I think that I'm going to bang on quite a bit about self-awareness because I think that if we can encourage self-awareness, it's the first step into being um, able to be responsible for our own well-being, but also in being able to be responsible for communicating with others about our well-being and empowering others and acknowledging that support looks different for everyone. Um, we work at the workplace that I'm currently in now, uh, which is called Wellbeing with Carrie. It's a it's the most preventative organization I've ever worked with. It's a an AI based tool that has grounded in your 
and we often talk about the pillars of of well-being and what is what is mental fitness and we look at the following pillars and four of these pillars are the health and safety pillars so they do actually fit quite nicely in with the hsc regulation we look at your role how you're coping how you feel supported, the relationships that you have in the workplace, and we've added in happiness because happiness matters as well. So when I'm, I'm going to go through this, and, and I kind of want you to think of it with two hats on. The first hat that I want you to think about is your own hat. So I want you to think about how does this tool apply to me as an individual, as a person, but I also want you to wear your manager's hat, and I want you to think about how great it would be to deliver this and explain this tool to members of your team in a meeting and, and actually see how, how you can use this tool to help them have their conversations. So when we talk about mental fitness and when I talk about mental health and well-being, it, it's not just thinking about how's my diagnosed problem going? Because it's not that simple. And also not everybody's going to have a diagnosed mental health problem. The um, Deloitte 2019 report, I think, reported that one in four of us have a diagnosed mental health problem. So that in itself says 25% of us have actually got something that we've talked to a doctor about. But there will be a heck of a lot more people out there who've never spoken to anyone. It actually took me 15 years to finally seek help from a doctor and get a diagnosis about what was going on in my brain and actually get help. So there's a lot of people out there who will be feeling different things and getting people to think about it is kind of a big hurdle. I used to work with a guy called Rob Stevenson at the Inside Out Charter, and he used to use something called Formscore, which I love. And I'm going to I'm going to say sort of use Formscore. You can look it up as well. I think that there's a free app that people can download. But the idea behind Formscore is that you grade you grade yourself on a scale of one to ten. One being absolute dire straits, you're not doing very well, and ten being that you're in peak mental fitness and you're doing incredibly well. But what is it that goes into those numbers? So getting people to have a think, where are you on a scale of one to 10? You sort of want them to think about how's everything going? So how well did you sleep last night? Do you feel well rested? I mean, that's one of the biggies. How how are you feeding yourself? Do you notice that you're, you're eating really good food for your body? Are you exercising? Are you drinking too much? Or are you, are you drinking when you usually wouldn't? which is uh, another big one. I remember, um, so yeah, again, I'm going to tell you some things about my life. I do remember when um, I went to a, a doctor and I was, I'd been really unwell for six months and I thought, why am I so sick? And I was very, very miserable. But of course, I didn't know that I was miserable and that it was my brain. And my doctor asked me how much I was drinking. And I, I sort of sat there and I said, well, I have a bottle of wine every day because it's so easy. You get home from work, you have a glass of wine, you have another two glasses of wine with your meal. And then in the weekends, the spot of binge drinking turned out I was drinking nine bottles of wine a week. How am I not dead? And I had to really like think about, wow, that's impacting me. That's making me sleep worse. That's making me that's making me behave differently. It's making me hungrier in the morning for different kinds of like McDonald's cut type foods. Have a think about what your role is doing at work. Is your role something that you can cope with? Do you feel like you're being pushed enough to feel like you're thriving and that you're learning and growing and not, not too bored? Or do you feel like you're being pushed too much and your workload is too heavy and you don't know where to turn? How are you coping with uh, with your role at work, but how are you coping at home? And especially think about if you're working with teams that are working remotely, what's going on for them? Like, the best thing that you can do is understand each other and understand where they're coming from. Are they sitting in an office that they get to use for their own or are they sitting in their room and they have housemates that they don't like or get along with? And do they have kids coming in and out? What's happening at home? The support as well, like how supported do you feel? Do you feel the support from your line manager? Do you feel the support from your colleagues? And what are your relationships like, not just in the workplace, but essentially, and again, I cannot stress enough with people working remotely, how are people's relationships in general? And it might seem like it's really nosy, but you're not asking people to tell you this or disclose this to you. You're asking them to think about it themselves in their own minds. And what are their happiness levels? What would you rate yourself at on a scale of zero to 10? Are you miserable? Are you unhappy? What are you, what's going on in your life? Are you feeling like your ambitions are being reached? 
how well do you feel financially? And this is a big one at the moment with the cost of living. Um, I, I feel like it was a surreal experience watching the news and everyone saying the cost of living is going up, the cost of living is going up. And then actually two weeks later, like an, like an aftershock of an earthquake, feeling it hit my pocket and going to Morrison's and thinking, how on earth have I just spent 20 pounds on a watermelon? It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty shocking. We're all going to need to think about how we can change our lives and how this is impacting us in different ways. So I've got this um, form that I'm going to send out, and I'm, it's only got four sections on, of it. It's a PDF, it's a one pager, and I'm going to send that out to you. And I would encourage you to complete it yourselves and try and do it when you're in a good space, because it's a, the best time for self-reflection is, is in that good space. The very first section that we've got simply says, what does it look like when your mental well-being starts to drop? And what I mean by this is have a think, sit down and think, what, what does it look like? What are the behavioural changes that happen when my mental well-being starts to drop? Uh, there's some like clues in this here, like do you become agitated or irritable? Do you withdraw? Do you find yourself sleeping more or sleeping less? And uh, one of the things, so some behavioural changes for me, one thing that really happens to me is that I have usually got an incredible memory. I've got an amazingly visual memory. I know where things are. Uh, I can I can see something in my mind. I'm completely fine. Now, this memory stands me in great stead. I don't even take notes in meetings because I remember so much. And if I am starting to fail in my mental well-being, I actually start to lose my memory. I start to dither. I think, oh my goodness, did I do this thing? I'm not sure. Uh, people call it brain fog, and I know that I experienced that. So I'll start forgetting. Other ways that my behavior will change is that I will become more irritable. So small things might set me off, and I will also become quite teary. So I know that if I'm in poor mental health, I'll start to get a bit emotional and and potentially cry. One of the best cries of my life was over a dog food ad because the West Highland Terrier was so terribly brave and I started weeping, a dog food ad. So that's a kind of change in behavior. Then the other behavioral changes that I know about myself, and again, this isn't necessarily something where you're making people tell you, you're asking them to think about it themselves. So one of my behavior changes is that I will drink more. Not these days quite so much, uh, but it is definitely my brain will go to that place where I will say I need a glass of wine to calm down. And if I'm not just drinking for the pleasure of the flavor or because I'm hanging out with my friends, that, that tells me that something's not right if I'm drinking for escapism. So that's for me, that that is a little signal that I need to think about, oh, what's going on for me that I'm thinking that I need this to de-stress by myself. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't drink alone. Sometimes a glass of wine in the garden is the best part of the day. But it's just being aware, am I doing this because it's the best part of the day or am I doing this because I'm worried about something? Um, I will also, I'm just trying to think about my other outward behavioural changes will be potentially in what I eat. I might want to eat more comfort foods. Now, my goodness, I just got massive fright. Sorry, at the window. Sorry, everyone. This cat just jumped up on the window. Please forgive me. It's my anxiety. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So just coming back to the behavioral chain, I'm so sorry if I frightened anyone. Um, just have, have a think about what it looks like when your well-being starts to drop. Does it look like my face? with a cat jumping up and giving me a fright. Uh, the next section is called, how would you like others to support you? And this one again, so I kind of want you to imagine for yourself in the first instance, so take on those two different hats. For you, think about this for you and then think about how you can facilitate a conversation with someone else about this. So how would you like others to support you? Um, everyone's different and I think this is a really important question because we can't expect our managers to be mind readers. We can't expect our family to be mind readers or our colleagues to be mind readers. We can't expect somebody to know what it takes to support you. Uh, we all have different needs and, and we need to really think about how we like to be communicated with. So 
I'll, I'll bring it. I'll bring it even back into the into my life where I work remotely and my partner works upstairs. Well, we don't. We sometimes talk to each other, but uh, we have a completely different support language. So Andy really hates being touched or hugged. If he's in a state of high stress, the last thing in the world he wants is a cuddle or for me to go in and be nice to him. At most, cup of tea and then maybe send him a message and say, you're all right, let me know if you want to go for a walk. Now, I'm the complete opposite and I need a cuddle. I need a hug. If I'm going through a period of great stress, I need an intervention quite quickly. And physical touch is something that that will kind of snap me out of it. And I'll bring it into the context of working in an office. My um, I used to work with a guy called John and John had permission to like to just give me a, a nice squeeze on the shoulder if he saw me going into a little bit of a loop. So that's that's where I'm talking about. How would you like others to support you? Also, some things might um, might upset you more. So I remember working with Highways England and at Highways England, they adapted their return to work policy so that uh, they weren't just sending out a letter when it came time to someone having to go back into the office that kind of rigidly said occupational health rules state that you have to do this when you come back into the office, because that would actually really upset somebody who'd been out of work for two weeks with depression or anxiety. So they changed it around a little bit and, and they had it in their policy that you could tell them how you wanted to be communicated with. So ask your colleagues and, and team members, how would you like to be communicated with if you are in a period of high stress? If I notice that you've had your camera off for the last two meetings, how would you like me to approach you about this? Do you want to call, a, a text, a chat on Teams? How do you feel about an email? And these are really easy questions to ask someone when they're well. And this is kind of where I'm, I'm rolling with this. So have a think about how you like others to support you. I did once have um, a manager who we had this conversation about supporting each other. And she said to me, if you ever see me in a, in a place where I'm not looking great, like if I'm looking upset or stressed, please don't be nice to me. If you're nice to me, I will cry. So I used to see her, I remember seeing her once and she she looked incredibly upset. And I said, come with me. And we, we went into like a quiet space and I just cracked jokes at her for ages. And she said, thank you so much for that. It's helped me to calm down. But had she not told me that, I wouldn't have known. So the next one here is, what ways do you know work for you to support yourself? So I think you can see where I'm going here. We're saying in the first part, what does it look like? How, how would someone else know if you're going in, in through a period of poor mental health? You're also saying, how would I know? How, what are the things that, that I do that make me know that I'm going into a period of poor mental health? The next one is how do you want others to support you? And this one is about how do you support yourself? And this is really important because I've done this for a long time and I've worked with organizations who believe it's not their problem to look after their employees' mental well-being or health. And I get that. Maybe maybe in part it's not your problem. Maybe in part it's it is, well, it's your own fault. You look after your own health. It's not my fault if you get a cold, it's not my fault if you get anxious. I understand that, but there is a balance. Organizations are there to provide an environment where people can feel supported or know that they can reach out to, to receive that help should they want to. And an organization should be interested in investing in somebody's well-being because when you have really well people, they work really well. They're really productive. They, they bring strength and joy to your workplace. So there should be an investment there. But we also need to be responsible for ourselves. We need to know that if I'm if I'm upset in the workplace and no one's no one's bothered to ask me how I am, well, what am I going to do for myself? So, what ways do you know support uh, work to support yourself? So, for example, um, and I've, I've popped in here. Is it mindfulness or a tea break? Now, both of those things I'm really bad at. So, so that's kind of, that's for the experts in the room. Uh, I'm terrible at the old mindfulness. I'm not good at meditation, but I know that it works for people. So is it mindfulness? Is it a moment of meditation? Is it that, like for me, 100%, I have the two words that absolutely help me, especially if I notice that I'm starting to go into that toilet roll holder obsession over the shoe thing. 
it's the two words are get outside. So for me, being outside underneath the big sky, even regardless of weather, will absolutely help me to regulate my heartbeat. It'll help me to regulate my emotions and it'll help me to come back to that 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 center of my brain where I'm in a bit more control. So um, for me, it's getting outside. So and if that's going for a walk, going for a bike ride, these things are really important. I also know and look at my face. <laughs> I also know that exercise really helps me. So I do try and do some exercise all through the week. I try and go to the gym three times a week. I do try and go for walks. I know that keeping my body in a place where I'm exercising really helps me, not just because I'm going to get toned, but because it's going to help me sleep well. And if I sleep well, I am far like I'm in a much better space to kind of regulate myself and to support myself. So these are the things that I know that will support me. But I also kind of want to, to reach out and sort of say, think about the things that support you. Maybe I'll, if we've got a bit of time, I'll ask for these top tips. I've done this before in sessions and I've heard some really incredible things. And I think one of my favorite things was um, a mindful shower. And this incredible woman, she said, oh, when I'm going through periods of, of poor mental health or if I've had a really stressful day, when I get home, I will go and I will have a shower, but I will I will think about washing the worries off. And she's like, she mindfully washes the worries off. Now I tried this and it worked. It did make me feel so much better. So I'm always up for like like weird things or new things. There are other things out there that are supportive for people. I like I've said, I'm not good at mindfulness or med meditation, but I am really I find that same sense of peace through being through making art and through being a painter. So I do lots of artworks and painting and I find that there's something really peaceful about the methodical working with paint on canvas. Uh, I know that some people play musical instruments and again it's that it's the it's the ability to calm that piece of your mind. And if you're at work and you don't have your painting gear at work to help you or if you're at work and you don't have your guitar or your piano there to play, what can you use in place of that that still targets that same area of your mind? So, for example, a colouring in book does it for me. I love it. Cross stitch for one of my colleagues. Absolutely. If it's music that helps calm you down, put something on Spotify and go for a walk and actually get into the rhythm of it and consciously listen. So have a think about what you know works to support you in the moment. So how do I get from this point of noticing that I'm going down? How do I rescue myself in the immediate? And then how do you rescue yourself on a bigger and a bigger scale? Like what do you need to put into place? And that brings us to the fourth one, which is the non-negotiables, that bigger space. So have a think about what already works for you that you can declare. These are my non-negotiables. Um, and this this came from so this came from when I was working with Rob at the Inside Out Leaderboard, and we were working with um, C-suite leaders who are happy to speak openly about mental health. Uh, so this is from a senior leader at PwC does this with his team, and he will ask his team. I think it's at the beginning of each week he'll be like, "What are your non-negotiables?" And it will be a time where his team can say, "Well, this week I need to." And they say that this is something that they won't move on. So it might be, I need to make sure that I'm picking my kids up from school every every day this week. Or I need to make sure that this week I don't go out at all. That's a non-negotiable. But non-negotiables might also be a part of your daily routine. So my non-negotiables, and I have a couple, um, I have an environmental non-negotiable, which is that I won't live anywhere that's not close to the sea. And I, I thought at first I thought it was kind of a whimsical reason. I was like, oh, you're such a romantic. You just want to live by the sea. Um, but actually, there are neurological reasons behind it. So living by the sea is incredible because you can look for a really far distance and not have your eye line interrupted. Now, apparently, this is the neuroscientist that I work with told me that when we are in built up areas, like if we're in the city or if we're in a suburb, our eyes move eight times faster than they do if we're in wide open spaces. And it's a basic survival mechanism. 
Now, if and and that's why I feel, or most people feel, way less stressed in the countryside or by the sea. So that's one of my big environmental non-negotiables. But another non-negotiable I have is that every single morning, and I will give up sleep for this. So if I have like a meeting somewhere at nine and I need to leave the house by seven, I'll wake up at five to do this. Every every morning, I have to have two cups of coffee and watch trash TV for at least one hour. And I'm not proud of this. Like, it's not like I'm going, oh my God, I'm reading these great books or I'm doing a yoga meditation practice or something that's that's something boast worthy. No, I'm watching Love Island. I'm watching Married at First Sight Australia. I'm having a cup of coffee with my cat and I am doing nothing. And like I said, I will give up sleep for this. It's part of my daily routine where I just kind of sit like an amoeba and pull myself into action. So that's some of my non-negotiables. But it might be that there are other things that are inspiring you um, or things that you know that you need to do of a week that you want to stick to. And this is quite a nice conversation to have with your teams as well, where you can say, right, let's think about self-awareness. Let's think about what we're doing. What are our non-negotiables? Non right, I'm going to come back to the camera bit. So just so that, so this is where I work with Wellbeing with Carrie. Feel free to check us out if you want to. But um, let's see if I can stop the share. I don't know if I know how to. Sorry for everybody that has to look at their own faces. There we go. Uh, so yeah, sorry, by the way, about the um, horrific cat incident in the middle of all of that, where I shrieked. <laughs> that, was, that was quite frightening. I think I've done quite well to pull myself back together. That's evidence of a good brain, good brain heart. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I just kind of, I'm going to send out that, pe pe I'll add it to the chat, or should I send it, Emma or Barry, to you to, to send on? Yeah, okay, I'll send out the PDF. So it's just a one-pager, and what I would um, advise is that you do the one-pager yourself. So you sit down and you just go through it and just go, oh, it's actually really simple. Do it yourself and have a moment of reflection. And then once you understand what, how easy it is and how to do that and what, what you think about it. Have a think about how you can present this to your team. So I've worked with organisations where I've said, do you know what, just have a team meeting devoted to this one thing. The value that you're going to get out of this will trump the value of a team meeting where you are discussing tasks done in the week, 100%. So dish it out, send it out to people, change it. You do not, it's it's the most basic format PDF. Change it up to match what you want to do or how you like to deliver and sit down with your team or sit down with anyone's team, swap it out, whatever, do it together and get people to, to fill it out as much as they're comfortable with and then talk about it. The important ones, things that you're going to get out of this is understanding how someone wants to be supported but also and helping them to understand how they can support themselves. So that's pretty much it from the tool capacity. And I've, I've left it with a bit of time so that I can field some questions. Um, and if there are no questions, I want people to, um, I want people to tell me what their top tips are for supporting themselves so that I can steal them and give them to other people. Any questions? Nothing. What What do you do with the tool? Is it just the process of going through it or do you do something with that after? Just the process. People keep it for themselves. So it's a the, the process is it's 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 a way of facilitating an open conversation. Um, the I would say that, um, like I was saying, this is quite low level. So the stuff that we do at Wellbeing with Carrie when it comes to the tech that we use we use the data that we collect to support you with your reporting to the health and safety executive. So there is something that we do with the, the data and the reports there. But with this, this is just about saying, how do we facilitate conversations? How do we understand each other better? And also importantly, how do you understand yourself? I think that there's um, there's a world, the world has changed quite dramatically. And I, I, share, I shared with you my story the other day about my friend who uh, she, she became incredibly unwell 
um, and this is while she was working from home, but the, the workplace never forced her to turn on her camera. So she didn't turn on her camera for six months. And because it was part of their policy, because it was a new thing, they were like, oh, we don't know what to do. We can't force anyone to turn on their camera. And so uh, my recommendation to her workplace was that they actually put something in that says, at the first five minutes of every meeting, I've got to see you because that's an important part of our connection. And you can use this tool to explain why you might need to do that. You can say, we are a team. We need to know how we are doing. We need to know how we can support you. And, and had she been asked, how are you best supported? She would have said, I like to be left alone. Now, what that does is that actually gives, like, it's not, it's not great, but it means that her manager would have had a lot less guilt when she fell really, really ill. And there's there's an element of um, self-responsibility that we get out of using tools like this, where we're saying, OK, we are putting together a space and an opportunity to speak to each other and to understand each other more. We're not going to make it too intense. We're going to keep it light and we're going to do this kind of thing. So lo lovely, lots of questions and, and comments coming in on the chat, which I'm not moderating, but I'm seeing them pop up and I want you to know that I really appreciate you. <laughs> Barry, did I even answer your question? <laughs> you did, you did. You said it's a process. <laughs> yeah, it's a process. It's a process, but you can turn it, if you want to do something more formal, do look at the WAPs. Nicki Minaj, that's who it is. Look at, look at the WAPs on the MIND website. So there, here's a couple of good websites to look at. So the MIND website will have them. They are huge. They are complex documents, but it might be good to get wrap your head around that kind of document. DWP definitely uses them in their policies. So DWP, all of the departments have been my clients from, from when I was working at May. So there will be these things in, in there. <gasps> top, top wellbeing support. This is from Barry. What have you got in there? Oh, see, that's so cute. That's so nice. Um, oh, James, James, really fantastic saying uh, avoiding cans of caffeine, alcohol, nicotine and sugar. Yeah, I avoid sugar, but I, it's more because I'm obsessed with my tooth health. But I'm sure that, that it's good. It's good for you um, to avoid sugar. So, yeah, I, I think that that's probably as much I mean I'm always open this is the other thing have a look for me on LinkedIn I am very very accessible if you send me a message or if you have a question I will respond um, but I think you've got a really incredible team here and Emma and Barry on hand to answer any other questions as well but yes on LinkedIn um, it's Sarah Restall as if I'm at rest all the time so relaxed um, I'm like one of three the other one's an accountant. You'll find me. <laughs> that's all we've got. For, that's all. There, there we go. Go, go, be free. You've got three minutes. Not quite, not quite, Sarah. One, one thing. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for being so open and uh, sharing and that confidence I can see in the comments. People love that and practical thing to take away. So thank you very much. Uh, as always, we've got a Menti poll um, to, to provide some feedback and uh, talk about what you might want on other sessions. Um, so I can just say thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's been very entertaining indeed. And you were funny, you were right. Oh, with a little help from a terrifying creature. Oh, that's the first time that's ever happened to me. <laughs> And I was, and I can't see anyone's faces, so I had, and let alone my own, so I had no idea what I was. <laughs> I went white, white as a sheet. Anyway, thank you very much, everybody. Have a really beautiful Friday and a fabulous restful weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.